do we have any lion scientists in the audience? What? Lion no? Tests. No lion, lion scientists? Tests. What? Lion tests. Lion tests. Wow. Drink. Let's drink to that. Let's drink to that. That's... You don't have to be a lion scientist to know that this is not what lions look like. That's why I bring this up. Yeah, this is not what lions look like. Right? And I, show you, I wanted to show you guys our fair mascot here because, you know, there's a lot of crossover with naturalists and museums and taxidermy. Uh, and I want to bring up that this is obviously not what taxidermy lions look like anymore, and that is because basically of one single man whose name is Carl Akeley. And if you've ever been to the American Museum of Natural History and walked into this hallway, it is called the Akeley Hall of African Mammals. It is named after Carl Akeley, who's basically like the Michael Jordan of taxidermy. <laughs> He dropped out of high school at age 15 and was like, Mom, I'm going to revolutionize the game because before him again, you would get something that looked like this bulbous cotton ball or sawdust, sawdust, sawdust stuffed, literally like a stuffed animal, not worthy of scientific study. Carl was like, I'm going to change the game. This is not going to work out any longer. So what he would do is he would usually collect the animal himself. This is not a lion. This is a wolf. Build a frame out of metal, large bones, and wood. Cover the whole thing in clay. Carve in every muscle, every sinew, every tendon, every vein. Restretch original fur, and then place it back in its actual realistic environment so you have a diorama that's worthy of scientific study versus whatever the fuck's happening here. <laughs> the rabbit looks good. The rabbit looks good. Yeah, Bunny's... I like his face, too. This guy's just... Anyway, so these are lions before Carl Akeley. These are lions after Carl Akeley. Wow. Wow is right. So the idea was, listen, I still remember the first time I went into the American Museum of Natural History, went into that hall, and I was like, these are beautiful. Uh, but I thought this is supposed to be an institution drink <laughs> about environmental stewardship and a love for nature. Why are we killing animals and putting them behind glass? Well, we're not doing that anymore. But at the time, the idea was, like, and by the time, I mean like early 30s. The idea was like, if you live on the Lower East Side or Brooklyn or the Bronx or anywhere in New York City, you've probably never been to Tanzania and you've probably never seen a giant kudu. So how do we get people thousands of miles away to care about animals in places they've never seen and possibly animals they've never even heard of? So when you go to the museum, you're basically looking at a 1932 version of a Google image search and then the plaque is like a little Wikipedia page. And I'm only kind of joking because like you couldn't do that in 1932. So the idea was, why don't we go to this exact spot, for instance, with these uh, giant greater kudu, why don't we go to this exact spot in Tanzania, take little drawings, this is before like digital photography, take little drawings, sketches of what the environment looked like, bring back actual real dirt, bark, rocks, leaves, and then select specific animals they saw, bring it back here and recreate as much as they can exactly what they saw in those places. And so while we're not killing animals in museums for taxidermy anymore, at the time this was a hugely important thing with respect to the opening of national parks and the passing of environmental stewardship laws. So shout out to Carl Akeley, the father of American taxidermy, and definitely go into this hall next time you're at the museum and look at these dioramas because the idea was literally to transport you, and it still does almost 100 years later, in place and time to a place you maybe have never been to have an experience, a meaningful, ideally experience with an animal you might not even know existed.